Welcome to the Hot Zone. It's December 11th, 2018. Denmark gives immigrants the cold shoulder. U.S. forces stage a massive exercise in the Nevada desert. And migrants keep piling up on the U.S. southern border. I'm Chuck Holton, and this is the Hot Zone. Welcome to the Hot Zone podcast with Chuck Holton. An experienced war correspondent who has covered wars and disasters for more than 15 years. Holton gives you a rundown of what the media isn't telling you about crisis around the world and lets you join him in doing something positive to help those who need it the most. Come along and engage with the news in a whole new way with Chuck Holton in the Hot Zone. Hello, everyone. We're going to spend a lot of time on immigration today, but before we get to that, I want to point out a huge exercise that's happening this week in the Nevada desert north of Las Vegas. It's called the JFEX, which stands for Joint Forced Entry Exercise, and it's the largest gathering of awesome firepower anywhere in the world. Hundreds of planes from jet fighters to the behemoth C-17 Starlifters and C-5 Super Galaxies all will be doing an incredible choreographed aerial ballet that's really something to behold. The ground pounders will be there also, with several mass tack airdrops scheduled to take place. This footage is from last year. I tell you what, watching these guys stand up and hook up and shuffle out the door brings back so many great memories. I was really fortunate to participate in about 100 jumps like that, and my knees are not happy, but the rest of me loved it. So Denmark is the latest country in Europe that is deciding that maybe massive waves of third world migrants aren't such a great thing for their collective pocketbook or their culture. On Facebook last week, the country's immigration minister, Inger Stojberg, made clear that migrants who cause trouble are going to be made to feel as unwelcome as possible. She announced plans to house the least welcome migrants, that is, those with a criminal background or those who can't be returned to their home countries for whatever reason. They're going to be housed on a tiny 17-acre island with very limited services. The island is about two miles offshore, and it boasts great tourist attractions like a crematorium and a lab for testing animal diseases. The minister says it isn't exactly prison, but it'll be a really brisk swim in the Baltic Sea for anybody who wants to leave. This move is just the latest in a series of measures aimed at making Denmark less exciting as a place to be an an asylum seeker. Earlier this year, uh, the Danish parliament passed a law that allows the country to confiscate any cash or valuables the migrants bring with them above about $2,000 to help pay for their care. Now, ever since the migrant wave into Europe started in 2015, with over a million refugees that year alone flooding into the continent, they're coming from places like... Syria and Afghanistan and North Africa, I've been predicting that the sheer numbers of refugees would fundamentally change Europe. That was abundantly clear, but what surprised the majority of pundits, including me, was just how much backlash we are seeing from voters across that continent. The largest mass migration since World War II is causing a huge political shift to the right in many countries, from from Hungary, where they built a huge fence along the southern border. I went and saw it. It's incredible. And they've refused to take their quota of migrants that was assigned to them by the European Union to the new right-leaning governments in Austria and Italy, Brexit in the U.K., and Angela Merkel watching her grip on power slowly slip away in Germany. Even Norway and Sweden, which is home to some of the most polite people on earth, are starting to vote more conservative because they see their country going up in flames, sometimes literally. I spent a couple of weeks this summer traveling across Europe and visited an average of one country per day on that trip. I talked to people everywhere I went about this issue and was really amazed at how unhappy most people are with the unfettered immigration that's being encouraged and in some cases paid for by left-wing groups like the United Nations and George Soros Open Society Foundation. Unfortunately, what Europe's finding is that if you bring in millions of people from countries that are essentially lawless, then you shouldn't be surprised if those people have a tough time with the concept of following the law. That means crime rates are skyrocketing in many parts of Europe, especially when it comes to things like robberies and sexual assaults. Now, I tried to explain how this could happen happen on a trip last spring to Berlin. Check this out. 
When we talked to Eileen earlier today, she made a very important point, and I just want to stress that point for you because it's so important. She said this is not a racial issue. This is a culture issue. Let me just explain to you what that means. Imagine that you grew up in Syria or Afghanistan or someplace like that. The only women you've ever seen that don't have a burqa on are in your own family. And all of a sudden you come to Germany and you go to take the bus one day. And here on the side of the bus stop is Germany's next top model. Now, let me just explain something to you. You've never seen anything like this in your life. And what is that going to make you think about German culture? What's that going to make you think about the sexual politics of how you find a girlfriend here or how you approach women? And I'm not saying that, th that this is wrong. I'm not saying there's anything bad with German culture. I'm just saying it's that different. And if you've never been exposed to it before, it's really shocking. And so that cultural difference is really what's causing these problems. And when you bring in two million people over the course of a year and a half or two years, they don't have to assimilate very quickly. And it is causing exactly what we're seeing here. Now, we need to learn from history. You can learn from Germany's history especially that all it takes is a charismatic leader to take hold of an issue like this that the people feel like the government is not doing a good job on, that they're weak on, and weaponize that issue to turn it into something that takes the country to a place it does not want to go. And that's why we're here telling you this story. Now, this kind of culture clash is causing lots of consternation across the continent. And even more surprising is the number of people who are looking to get a gun for self-defense. That is a big change. So many people in Italy, for example, want to have better ways to protect themselves that one town near Milan that I visited began pushing a program to help subsidize the purchase of a firearm to, for all of its citizens. Listen to part of my interview with the daughter of the mayor of the beautiful town of Borgo Sesia. I read, uh, Grant, uh, that the, the laws here were, are, are actually kind of antiquated. And so if you get a permit to, to uh, protect yourself, you can carry a cane with a 20-inch blade, but you can't carry pepper spray, you can't carry a taser or any kind of non-lethal because the, the law was put in place before that stuff existed. Is that correct? Yeah. Basically, I mean, you can have a firearm in the house, and if somebody was to break into my house, if I were to shoot them, um, I would then have to pay the damages for that person's family, and I would suffer. So you're the, the one that gets in trouble. Yeah, because you need to first of all, before you can aim and shoot, recognize that they have a firearm on them, and then have to recognize if it's real or not. Okay, so tell me what they call it if you were to shoot somebody and they decide that that firearm wasn't real; it was a BB gun or something. Well, it would be attempt murder. Attempt no, oh, okay. I thought yeah. you said it was like uh, excessive self-defense. Yeah, also excessive self-defense, yeah. but you'd probably, if you like shot and killed them, it would be attempted murder. I got you. So they, they actually have a, a law that's called using excessive self-defense, <laughs> which uh, obviously they, the, the Italians here would like to see changed. Chuck, it's unbelievable to me to think, first off, uh, I love Miss Barbali talking about immigration the way we talk about it. Chuck, you and I talk about it here in America. We need her to go to Berkeley and inform right. some of the students there about, about immigration. But then to hear liberal policies that we see in cities like in California, same thing going on in Italy there, that there is this head in the sand mentality that somehow an attacker is not going to do you any harm first instead of the fact that the attacker could do you harm first and you have a right to protect yourself. Now, how is, how is she, Ms. Barbali, well, tell me, someone comes into your home, are you not expected to protect yourself? I mean, in a sense, yeah, we are, but we're not supposed to shoot. Like, if you have a firearm on you, you're not allowed to do anything. So I don't know. I don't know what they expect us to do. Like, I'm not going to sit and wait. Maybe just run away, I yeah, suppose. I'm not going to sit and wait to be harmed. Like, neither my parents would obviously, like, protect your children first. And I don't think my parents would wait for the worst to happen your immediate instinct is to protect your property and the people you love around you. We found this sentiment all across Europe, which I have to say is a big change from even five years ago. 
And even more prevalent is the feeling that so many migrants are overwhelming Europe's generous welfare systems. I mean, think about it. People are coming from Syria or Yemen who are accustomed to living on a dollar a day or so. And then they find out all they have to do is head north. And if they make it, they can get free housing, free medical care, free education, and up to a couple thousand euros a month. And they don't even have to work for it. What's to stop everyone from the third world to try to get in on that deal? And can you blame them? I mean, if they're handing out cookies, don't blame me for getting in line. Now let's look at what's happening with immigration here on our side of the pond. The so-called migrant caravan is still held up at the border in Tijuana, Mexico. There are roughly 10,000 people living in squalid camps there. And when a thousand or so tried unsuccessfully to charge the port of entry a couple weeks ago, their American dream has kind of started to turn into a nightmare as they were turned back by lots and lots of Border Patrol agents with tear gas and things like that. So many of these humble people from Honduras and Guatemala and El Salvador were encouraged or even celebrated by the media for deciding to simply walk to the promised land. They were being helped along their way by sympathetic locals and churches and left-wing groups. But now that help is drying up then the migrants are kind of stuck. I mean, nobody's going to help them get back home now that it's proving a lot harder than they were told to get into the United States. When I was traveling with the caravan as they crossed from Guatemala into Mexico, there were already some people who were having second thoughts. As I drove north documenting their progress, hundreds of people begged me for a ride in my car. And although I could have easily carried four or five people the 20 miles or so to their next stopping place, I refused to give any of them rides. And it felt kind of mean, I have to admit, watching those hot, weary travelers, sometimes with tiny babies, walking along in the tropical heat while I rode in comfort in my air-conditioned rental car. But I wanted to do the most loving thing possible. I could see what's now happening on the U.S. southern border. I could tell many of these people would never qualify for asylum. And they were being driven on by a false hope. And it isn't loving to engender false hope in people. Neither is it loving to encourage someone to steal from others, which is essentially what that person is doing when they illegally cross our borders. See, they're immediately stealing taxpayer dollars as we have to be forced to house them and care for them while they make their way through the asylum process. And then they're stealing from other migrants who are attempting to enter the country the right way. So I didn't give any rides north, but when I got to their next stopping point, which was a little town called Weeksla, I found thousands of people sleeping on cardboard on the sidewalk or sleeping on pews inside the main Catholic church in town. The heat was oppressive. It was dirty. It was nasty. Groups were there handing out food and clothes and medicine, but nothing fancy. While I was there, I found a woman who told me she had had enough. Her name was Judy, and she had a little 18-month-old girl named Noeli Montserrat. Now, I was planning to drive back to the Guatemalan border anyway that evening and stay in Tapachula, so I offered to give Judy a ride. And shortly after leaving town, we picked up another straggler, a 17-year-old kid who'd had enough of walking. This little baby is Montserrat, and her mother is Judy. Nelson is there in the back seat. Uh, I'm heading back towards the border with Guatemala in Chiapas State, south of, uh, in, in southern Mexico. Uh, the caravan is swollen to maybe seven or eight thousand people in Huixla, uh, and they're getting ready to leave and go further north. But these two decided they'd had enough. The heat and the hunger and the uncertainty just proved to be too much for them and they decided they'd, they'd rather go home. So since I'm heading that way, I'm going to give them a ride back to the border. We found out that the Honduran government has provided buses for people who want to go home. And we're going to try to go find those and uh, get them back to Honduras. They say that they left Honduras in the first place just simply because there are no jobs, which means no money, which means no food. There are people actually going hungry there now, and um, they've always had a dream of going to the United States, but it looks like this is not the way it's gonna happen for them. I drove them back to the border where we shared a nice supper before I put them on the raft to cross back into Guatemala. Word had it that the Honduran government was offering free bus transport on the other side of that river uh, back to their hometown of San Pedro Sula. 
I have to say, watching little Noelle float away into the darkness on that raft just about tore my heart out. I gave them some money, but it was pretty clear they would have to sleep on the ground that night. But it was their choice. And so, you know, I've been able to keep in touch with Yudi via WhatsApp since that day. And they did, in fact, make the last bus back to Honduras. And they're back home now with Yudi's grandmother in San Pedro Sula. Work is very hard to come by for a young single mother anywhere, but especially there. And so I imagine it's not going to be much of a Christmas. So let's change that, shall we? I'm going to send Yudi and little Noelle a gift for Christmas. Do you want to pitch in? This is the kind of thing we're going to do on this podcast. Not just make the news, but make the news good. We're going to reach into the lives of the people affected by world events and show them what love looks like. Now, I'm super excited that so many of you want to join me, and I hope you will. So that's all for the podcast today. If you want to get involved, visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash hotzone or send a one-time donation through PayPal via hotzoneholton at gmail.com. That's hotzoneholton, all one word, at gmail.com. We'll be back again tomorrow. I hope you have a great one. Until then, and I'm Chuck Holton, so thanks for joining us on The Hot Zone. This has been The Hot Zone with Chuck Holton, produced by Amy Holton, copyright 2019.